Welcome to the Hey Legal Quiz with me, Edith Forrest. The aim of this quiz is to provide some light-hearted entertainment during lockdown and beyond. I'll be asking 20 questions of leading Scottish legal figures, questions which give insight to their careers and their lives beyond the law. So let's begin. So I'm joined today by Lady Scott, who's kindly agreed to take the Hey Legal Quiz. Thank you so much, Lady Scott. No, it's no problem. <laughs> so we have. Nice to see you. Oh, nice to see you too. Um, we have 22 questions um, that we're going to uh, ask you, and uh, we're really looking forward to your answers. Um, so we'll just kick off with the first one. Um, okay. If you, if you weren't a lawyer, what would you be? Yeah. I think my answer to that is quite a long one, so you have to bear with me. Okay. Because. Um, I wasn't a lawyer for quite a long time. I didn't go straight into the law at all. In fact, I didn't start, I didn't become professionally qualified, I don't know, am I just nearing age 30? I did a law degree, um, but it was law and politics. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, just telephone call there, hold on. <laughs> um, and um, it was all jurisprudence, criminology, for political philosophy. I think I did criminal law, but basically I didn't do all the subjects you have to do to become a lawyer. Okay. So years later when I decided it, I had to uh, go back to university and um, do a year covering all the ground. So um, I, I did law, but with no intention of becoming a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And um, after this, I went and did all sorts of things for a long time. They were all related, really, to the areas of law. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of voluntary work. I was very involved in campaigning and, and voluntary work, which was connected quite often to the law. And I did jobs that were connected to the law. So as soon as I left university, I went to London, and I lived there for quite a long time. And um, I got a job. Uh, I had a sort of job with a publishers briefly which and then I got a job with an organization called Release. Quite well known in this it was set up in the seventies um and it was a big drugs and law center and I worked there doing legal advice work, not and a little bit of drugs work, but mainly legal advice. Um so it was a fairly wacky ex hippie organization. <laughs> Um, and was great fun. Lady Scott, sorry, just the, the, the connection was a little um, dodgy when you said the name of it. Release. Release. It was, okay. it was in West London. It was quite a big organisation. Um, we did a lot of emergency legal help. So I worked with a lot of lawyers. We did a lot of legal advice and uh, support and um, attending police stations. We did, they did festivals, giving advice on, on site and demonstrations, giving a lot of advice and stewarding and so on to demonstrations. And then there was lots of drugs work and I worked with them, um, um, drug agencies. So it was, it was hugely entertaining and not like a real job at all. Yeah. Um, and after that, I worked for the GLC, the Greater London Council. Right. Um, this is in the days of Ken Livingston, where they had lots of money given to people to do projects and research. Mm -hmm. And I got a job with the police committee, which was to do research into um, policing, public order events and training of police. And again, you just left to do what you wanted and it wasn't like a real job. <laughs> and um, I really quite enjoyed that. And that came to an end when the GLC was shut down. Um, and... During all of that, and I did lots of volunteer work, as I say, so I worked with um, Rights of Women, I worked with civil liberties organisations, um, and of course, at the time I was in London, there was um, a lot, quite a lot of riots, and it was during the miners' strike, so there was, you know, lots going on, and I worked with a lot of barristers who were at what we would call then um, sort of radical chambers, Mm -hmm. And I got interested then that um, that's maybe what um, I would do, you know, actually um, become a barrister. And then I decided 
I want you to do that back home in Scotland. Yeah. So, so that was a long kind of trek, really. But if I um, uh, so I then became a qualified lawyer, but if I were to leave the law and do something else, which I could do, I could leave very easily. Um, I would go back to the same sort of campaigning, maybe a bit of academic work mm-hmm. um, and voluntary type things. So when I was in the bar at the bar, I was very involved in justice, for example. I would go back to work like that. Right. Okay. Well, that's really interesting. So you've had a lot of experience. Um, working in and around the law, I suppose, until you made that decision to, to become an advocate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I was pretty clear that I would go to the bar and not be a solicitor. I worked briefly as a solicitor, but the minimum, really, and then I uh, came to the bar. Yeah. Um, so, I, um, but as I say, I think unlike a lot of people, and maybe because of that background, I could easily stop and do something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you still got okay. interests elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, question number two is, did you have a nickname at school? And if so, what was it and why were you given it? I didn't have a nickname at school. Um, the only time I got a nickname really was when I was at the bar, briefly. That's at least that's the only time I can remember. I, mean, I was called names, I'm sure, but I didn't have a nickname except perhaps at the bar when Paul McBride used to call me Millie Tant. <laughs> and for some reason that took hold and uh, that last, lasted a while. Yeah. <laughs> Millie Tant. Yeah, remember the Viz cartoon character that Millie, called Millie Tant? Uh, I don't know personally, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure many of the viewers will recall it. Okay, so that stuck with you for a while at the appeal court. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, and sticking with school, uh, question three is, were you a swatty type at school? No, no. I mean, I hated my school. I really hated school. Really? And Yeah, I really didn't like it. And um, it was a small all-girls private school I went to and um, it was very narrow in its view of the world. I think we were all there so that we could all become well brought up girls but beyond that you know education wasn't high on the list Um, and it was very strict and um, well I suppose I learned two things. One was I was told that um, I mentioned the fact that I might do law Mm -hmm. which was greeted with um, some dismay and also a derision. So that, of course, drove me into doing it. So unfortunately, that was really the part of the wheel. And um, a, uh, it left me with a great sense of uh, unfairness um, mm-hmm. and uh, intense dislike of unfairness. Yeah. But that's good. I suppose you could, have, you could have gone one of two ways, having been told you couldn't do something, then you might have just accepted that and um, gone on. But obviously your character was such that you thought, well, if you say I can't, then let me just show you that I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I mean, it was pretty immature and I'm sure I could be pretty annoying. So, yeah. <laughs> You got your own back whilst you were there anyway. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Question number four is, what was your first job? Ooh, um, well, my first job was a summer job at a biscuit factory. Right. Um, which was pretty grim. But, well, it was grim at the start because they gave me a job in what was called quality control, uh-huh. which involved sort of examining biscuits and tasting and really it was about being a taster <laughs> and I and I hated that but firstly because you know you start your shift at six o'clock and you had to taste lots of different biscuits and crisps as well right. um, and also you weren't on the shop floor where everybody was mm-hmm. and you weren't very popular as quality control <laughs> so I asked to be demoted to the shop floor, which I was, and I that was fine after that. Right, goodness, and and um, you know, talking about it, you'd think that that was the preferred uh, post to be tasting the, the the produce rather than the shop floor. But imagine the banter and the 
Um, just the yeah, it was all yeah, it was more fun. It was great fun on the shop floor. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Oh, that's that's really. Are we allowed to ask what biscuits they were, or is that disclosing too much? All biscuits that I'll never eat again. Um, uh, uh, digestives. Uh, the crisps had hideous tastes like lamb and mint oh. and things. Well, sorry. <laughs> That's all. I, that's the only ones I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very interesting. Um, all right. Question number five is: How do you define success, Lady Scott? Uh, well, I suppose for me, success is feeling that you make when you make a, dis, a difference, when you feel that you've made a, a positive contribution. That's when I. That's what I would call success, and that could be professionally or um, in life, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So I, I've, you know, like to feel that I'm making a difference. So that's why I think I, when I was at the bar, I went to into appeal work. Mm-hmm. I mean, partly for a love of the law, but partly because I wanted to make a difference, and that was I felt, in terms of legal reform and the law, that was where to where to do it. Yeah. So. Um, and that, in that work, whilst of course winning is always good, actually it was winning and knowing that that case had made a difference. Yeah. That mattered. Absolutely. Where you can influence, I suppose, many cases rather than just dealing with, with one case at first instance, you can, you can influence a number of, of cases by, by what you're arguing, what you're standing for in the appeal courts. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Well, the majority of the time uh, in the appeal court, winning is um, just being able to keep going, you know, <laughs> and, and surviving. But um, real success was when you managed to, if you did manage to uh, feel that you'd got an interpretation or a reform that matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Uh, question number six, your favourite drink? Ah, Coffee. I'm a bit of a snob about coffee, and I'm very keen on it. So it has to be ground beans, particular mm-hmm. kinds of beans, and it has to be done through good machine. I have a very ancient and temperamental but marvellous coffee machine at home. So um, coffee, I drink quite a lot of it. All right. Okay. Um, question number seven is what don't you like about your job? Well, it's very hard to get decent coffee. Um, <laughs> you know, it's quite difficult to access that when you're in court all the time and nipping out. You haven't got time to go in it. Um, I suppose, seriously, uh, the thing I find uh, most uh, that I don't like as a judge is um, there's a degree of isolation that's quite extreme. So you're obviously you're sit on the bench, you're on your own, it's your responsibility, your decisions. Mm. Um, obviously, there's a safeguard in that you have an appeal court to correct any mess you make, but um, it, is, it, it is an isolating job, and mm. I like working in a team, and I'm definitely at my best in a team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's, that's what I don't like. Okay, all right. Um, question number eight. Which was your most memorable case to date? Oh, um, well, I can't really discuss any um, as a judge, and I can't say that I've got very many measurable, me, um, memorable cases as a judge. Um, but as um, an appeal counsel, I definitely had cases that I remember. I suppose the most that sticks out is... Um, second appeal in Lockerbie that I did. So I was instructed to draft the application after the first appeal failed to the Criminal Case Review Commission. Right. And then um, take the appeal and we ran for the appeal. So I was worked in that case for about four years, Mm -hmm. four to five years. And I had a fantastic team, which was, you know, really great to work with. They were really good. And it was lovely working in a team and there was a lot of, uh, uh, it was huge, it was complex. We could consult lots, of, there was a lot of expert evidence. Um, and 
uh, you know, obviously it was it was well funded and it was high profile. But um, it's live again, so I can't discuss any more than that, really. No. But other than that, there are memorable cases to me, I think, from just in the appeal court, which changed the law, made a difference. Yeah. So I think um, Thompson against Crow would be the first one I did that I felt made a difference. Mm -hmm. And Calbraith, the... Mm -hmm case which was about um, diminished responsibility and changing the law on diminished responsibility. Um, and then in the other work I did in the appeal, before the appeal court and the Privy Council, they were all memorable. Probably Holland, which was about doc identification and disclosure. That was the first, I think, appeal to the, uh, to the Privy Council with, and where the... Uh, uh, the conviction was quashed by the uh, by London, which mm -hmm. was caused quite a stir, and it's certainly memorable. Um, what, what else? And Nat Fraser, that was another one that um, that was that was another interesting Supreme Court case. That was the last one, last one of Lord Roger as well. Yeah. Um, so all of these are kind of memorable. Um, but um, I suppose probably Galbraith is my favourite of all of these, okay. actually, because it really did make a difference to the defence of women uh, who suffer abuse or violence mm -hmm. in respect of uh, you know women who've killed, and that's an ongoing subject. But I think that really shifted the uh, territory and opened up a defence for those women, which I felt, and it was an all-women team as well. Oh, was it really? Yeah, it was an all-women team. So mm -hmm. that, it was great. Very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, question number nine. Uh, tell me one thing that would surprise me about you. Oh, that's difficult. Um, <laughs> I'll come back to that, if I may. Okay, of course. <laughs> yes. Question number uh, 10. What mm -hmm. trait in others irritates you the most? Trait? I'm not sure. I mean, abuse of power of any kind, I don't like. Yeah. Um, you know, unfairness, as I've said, you know, how I dislike that. I don't like... Um, disrespect, disrespect to people, for example, in court users, including um, witnesses and accused. Um, I don't like bullying of any kind. Mm -hmm. So it's all sort of abuse of power type things. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't like a very everyday kind of casual sexism that still goes on. Um, and certainly aren't enough women around. There's still quite a chaps or lads culture i feel mm -hmm. um so that i can find quite irritating yeah okay all right <laughs> um question number 11 favorite flavor of crisps well my crisp biscuit factory experience <laughs> meant i only like plain crisps if i'm going to have a crisp at all really that that put you off for life did it <laughs> yeah mm. Okay, so plain crisps. I, I think I've said to quite a number of people, it's it's remarkable. I, not that I'm a huge crisp fan myself, but I would I would take a packet of salt and vinegar. But I'm surprised at how few people actually um, have favourite crisps or even enjoy eating crisps at all. So it seems a bit of a contentious question. Well, I'm surprised you like salt and vinegar, Edith. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, question twelve. What book would you recommend everyone should read? Well, that's an impossible question. Okay. Um, if I, well, if we took it to professionally, mm -hmm. then um, uh, first of all, if, if for young lawyers or, or aspiring lawyers, I would recommend um, a book from the eighties. It's a small little. Uh, paperback and it was uh, written by 
uh, female journalist, uh, a fantastic woman called Nell McCafferty. Right. And she was working for the Irish Times and she was a journalist and she sat in the district court in Dublin every day. Right. And she wrote stories and wrote about the uh, court. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a fantastically realistic uh, picture um, of what goes on in, in, in the court. Right. It's, it, 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 she, wrote, she writes very well and, and quite you know, um, ang angry and also very funny uh -huh. about the, the trail of, of uh, poverty and the damaged people that you see going through the court every day in a criminal court. Yeah. Um, and we still see that, and we still see that at every level, including the High Court. Yeah. It's so much about poverty and um, damaged people. So she, I thought, ca captures that really well in her book about the District Court mm. in Dublin. Yeah. Could easily be Glasgow District Court. Yeah. It's uh, similar. Um, and the other book I would say, which would be more for judges, would be Albie Sachs. Um, uh, the strange alchemy of alchemy of life and law. I think that's what it's called. It's um, I think I mean I think he's a fantastic yeah. uh, guy. It's very interesting, amazing life. You know, from um, freedom fighter to sitting in the Constitutional Court in South Africa. Mm. That's quite a journey. And the books are about that. It's about his experiences. It's about his approach to the law, it's very much about social justice. Um, and it's a good, good, good uh, read for thinking about what you do as a judge and how you achieve justice. Mm -hmm. So I'd recommend that. Right. Fantastic. Both sound really interesting books. And um, I found that lots of the recommendations we get on, uh, on the quiz, I've actually bought a couple of the books that people have bought, uh, recommended. So those are two that I think I'll be adding to my list, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Well, Nell McCafferty's might be quite difficult to get. I think you'd have to go um, second-hand shops for that. Okay. Or on on online for that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's called In the Eyes of the Law. Right. Okay. Okay. Definitely take a note of that. All right. Uh, question thirteen: Do you have any irrational fears? Well, like everybody, I have what I think are entirely rational fears. <laughs> don't have irrational fears. That's for others to judge. Um, I don't really have any. Um, what I could say is that I come from a very Presbyterian stock. Mm -hmm. um, my family weren't religious at all, but they were all come from that Presbyterian culture. And I think that if you're a Presbyterian, you go through life... Um, if you've got that background, you go through life uh, slightly in fear of everything and certainly expecting the worst. Um, so that's the only thing I would say. I sort of carry that with me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, question 14. Your, how old are your oldest pair of shoes? No. Um, I'm quite keen on shoes. Um, Probably not what others would expect. My, the oldest pair of shoes that I have, but I didn't get, they belonged to my mother. And I um, was given them by her. And so they must be really old. I mean, they would be in the 1950s. Yeah. Brogues. Beautifully, beautiful they are. Um, beautiful leather, incredibly smart, but very heavy. So pretty unwearable and didn't really entirely fit. But they're just a fantastic pair of brogues. That, you know, I'm a very much a flat shoed girl. Edith. Uh -huh. <laughs> I've never worn a heel in my life. Right. And I think brogues and those brogues are yeah, I'm very fun. I look at them, but I don't wear them because they're too uncomfortable. Right. But these, they're very obviously special in a number of ways. The, their design, plus the fact they're from your mother, I imagine. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, question 15. Who has had the biggest influence on your career in the law? Well, nobody, I mean, you know, no single person. There's a whole conglomeration of people. Yeah. Um, when I went to university, um, 
uh, I met, I uh, became very good friends with a chap called Paul Brown. And Paul was in, really inspired me and got me interested in uh, what was called very much at the time unmet legal need about mm -hmm. using the law to help people who, who the law missed so often. And Paul became, you know, a leading like the law centre movement. He was at Castle Law Centre for a long time at Legal Services Agency. And he's been a bit of an inspiration and certainly had an influence on the uh, approach to that and the issues of unmet legal need. Um, when I was in London, I was quite influenced by a lot of the barristers that I worked with or sort of, um, and, and was in various... Um, sort of in the background in various cases, um, who inspired me to get into the law. So I was quite influenced by them. Uh, at the bar, in terms of judges, um, I was a huge fan of the great Lord Roger, who I appeared I had the pleasure of peering in front of frequently. Not always a pleasure, I have to say. Quite often, <laughs> if he got annoyed with me, I know that he would sort of slip slightly down in a seat and disappear from view. <laughs> and when he disappeared from view, I knew I was just not getting anywhere. Um, but he was a huge, uh, a huge uh, influence um, because of his intellectual rigour and his, uh, the way he thought, which is sort of very clear thinking. Yeah. And he was strongly believed if something was right, if the, if the interpretation of something was right, the right one, mm. then that's what had to be uh, dealt with, not he was whatever the consequences. Mm. So he would be doing justice, notwithstanding the, uh, the uh, consequences that might follow. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, I'm, this is, yeah, hugely influenced by him. And of course, he was um, also um, the driver in Galbraith. Yeah. I mean, so much so that he, he uh, for part of the case, we had, we, I was trying to overturn a particular uh, decision. And I'd had researched all the background to say, or to say that to be able to establish that this decision was out of kilter mm -hmm. and should be changed. But there was a very short report. It was a, 19, a 1920s decision. And it kind of mattered what the circumstances of it were, but I couldn't really identify them. I don't know, Roger went off himself and got all the press reports of the case, because at that time there was verbatim reporting mm -hmm. in the 1920s, and he got them all from the Scotsman, and uh, so that we all found out the circumstances. So that's mm -hmm. a judge who follows something, you know, all the way through. So I was hugely inspired by that. Yeah. Um, and it was... and. Um, at the end of Godbraith, that's probably my most memorable moment in terms of in court, he came off the bench and came into the well of the court and shook my hand. So oh. that was that was pretty special. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And the other judges, of course, the unbelievably fantastic Lord Bingham, who was all like Roger, unfortunately, is not with us. And I appeared in front of him and he was... Uh, he was the most intimidating judge I found because he was so uh, incredibly, you know, clever. And he used to summarise what you were saying so much better than you were trying to put it. <laughs> and you, I ended up feeling he was so nice and he was so polite to everybody. You ended up feeling that you just didn't want to disappoint him. Yeah. Now that has a really powerful effect, actually. Mm -hmm. The, if you're appearing before someone that you just don't want to disappoint. So yeah. I thought he was really uh, powerful and uh, uh, I really uh, admired him. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he was an influence. A big influence on your career. Oh, thank you so much. It, uh, are, are those, the, I, I presume, I mean, I think most people say, well, you know, you're, you're st everybody's still kind of influenced by people, but those are the ones that stick in your mind as having the most influence in your career. Well, they certainly made me. Yeah, they made me pay so much attention, and then I learned so much just from watching it. Yeah. You know. Um, so yeah, yes, that was an important. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, question sixteen, maybe a more straightforward question. Favorite chocolate bar? Um, but first, know about chocolate as well. Um, <laughs> so I don't really have a chocolate bar. 
um, you know, a small box of handmade chocolates. <laughs> but I desist from that really nowadays, I'm afraid. So um, I'll do it and put it in the past tense, handmade oh, chocolates. Handmade chocolates, lovely. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, question 17, what's the fanciest event you've ever been to? I don't like fancy events. Um, <laughs> I don't go to fancy events, really. But I can tell you that I have uh, been to some unusual events, I think, mm -hmm. and um, I like finding out everything. And, in fact, the weirdest, I can tell you my weirdest event, okay. not fancy event, and this might be a surprise. So, there's right. a surprise. So, we're on, going back to answer... Um, sure. question yeah, something as well. that will surprise you. This might surprise you. Okay. Um, I once went, it was a, quite a night, I once went to the Scottish Women's Bodybuilding Championship in Paisley Town Hall, <laughs> which was a riot, and it was quite astonishing, and uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed it, and it was bizarre in the extreme. Mm. So, um, it, uh, I knew somebody who was a neighbour of mine who was in it, and... Um, a bunch of us went to um, see it, and it was, uh, I mean, it was very loud. <laughs> um, it was utterly bizarre, as I say. So, I mean, it was fancy in the sense that everybody was, um, you know, tanned all over and in <laughs> bizarrest sort of skimpy outfits and stuff. I mean, it was just quite extraordinary and riotous. So that's, that, was, that's, that was memorable. Yeah. Uh, it sounds it, um, and... Having been a fiscal in Paisley, I can only imagine yeah. <laughs> what the, the rest of the crowd were like. Um, yeah. Well, why? Wow, that is that is both um, fancy, incredible, and I suppose quite weird, as you say, as well. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, okay. Question 18 is, what quirks do you have? Uh, again. And quirks. Oh, I know that. Um, going back to shoes, uh -huh. I wear trainers a lot. Right. And I wear trainers usually to get to court. Mm -hmm. I don't wear them in court. Um, though I think I did once in sheriff court and got got a row from somebody. But um, <laughs> but I, I people seem to find that really quirky, and I don't understand that. I mean, it's a bit American, maybe. Mm. But I like. You know, you can walk. It's the way to walk. Yeah, I like comfortable shoes, and it was the way to. But I mean, I remember in the Sheridan trial, the fact that I arrived to court wearing trainers was on the front page of the Herald. I, I couldn't understand really? it. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness, no, I agree. I think trainers are the way forward. Certainly, to get yourself to and from court. I, I wear heels in court. Although I did, like you, um, I had my trainers on. It was the high court, and it was by mistake. I'd forgotten to pack my heels. Um, I think mm. a senior. I think it was Neil Murray was my senior, and I'd asked him. I'd got my wig and gown and stuff on, and asked if you know if he noticed anything about me. And he'd said, "Well, no, you just look normal, apart from the fact you're wearing trainers." So we agreed that I would run in behind him in the hope that nobody yeah. would notice. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I agree. I think you need to be comfortable, don't you? Especially walking mm -hmm. around and. Um, yeah. yeah, I once went to it's about these things forgetting things. I once went to um, a case, um, and Edgar Preece was also in it. And we, he was representing different accusers. And Sheriff Court in air, but he, uh -huh. um, he he was driving, and I had uh, pres um, prescription sunglasses. It was a beautiful <laughs> day, and we zoomed down to the coast and off to air. And then I went in to do my case and realised that I didn't have my ordinary specs with me. Right. I left these at home. I only had sunglasses. <laughs> and I, without them, I couldn't. I mean, without glasses, I can't see things. So um, I had to decide whether to do it, this case blind or <laughs> whether I should wear sunglasses with my wig on. And Edgar made a huge noise about all this. It was very entertaining. And... Uh, so he got everybody to get all geared up, and um, I just I, turned out. In fact, it was just going to be adjourned. So I thought that's fine. I'll just do it blind. Yeah. 
But when I got when I when I stood up, the clerk was sort of hissing at me. Can you see the man is in the dock now? And Edco kept shouting. Do you not want to speak to your client? Your client's looking at you. You know, he's just making all this sort of joke about the fact that I couldn't see my cues. You know? so, <laughs> it's just to put the case off. I hasten to add, so it didn't matter. And I told him. <laughs> Oh dear, yeah, absolutely. That would have been quite cool though if you had appeared with your sunglasses on in the wig. <laughs> oh dear, yeah. I suppose it's, it's always a, well, I find it, um, I don't, even though I've packed my wig and gown and I know that they're in the car or they're with me, sometimes I just always double check because, you know, it's, um, especially mm. a wig's quite a personal thing. You don't really want to be borrowing somebody else's, do you? <laughs> Well, I've done that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, question 19 um, is, what is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? Well, professionally, um, I was told when I was devilling training mm -hmm. that... Um, I was told that if you're preparing a case, it's really important to just take just to stop and go and take a walk, right? So that you you know go and think, mm -hmm. never go just steaming through. Just always pause and think. And I think that was really good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, question twenty is: What is the weirdest talent that you have? Oof. Really have weird talent. I've got very dexterous feet. I can write with my toes and Whoa. I can pick things up with them. So that's a talent, I suppose. Certainly is. I'm impressed at that, being able to write with your feet. Well, I'm not saying that it's legible, particularly, <laughs> but then maybe none of my writing is that legible. So. <laughs> Okay, um, and we've come to the last question, Lady Scott, which is question 22. What have you enjoyed most about lockdown? Um, well, I mean, there's obviously that um, it's a serious thing. And um, my experience initially was that I was visiting my son in Seville and we were locked down there. So then came back here and... Uh, Things were a bit difficult at first, but then um, later on, uh, I start to really enjoy it. So okay. what I found was, was great being with the family. That's fantastic. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, with, you know, good time, quiet time. Mm -hmm. Loved walking the dogs through Edinburgh that was empty. Mm -hmm. I loved the, taking photographs at Edinburgh of bits that you don't notice because of all the people. Yeah. So, and I've done a lot of walking and... Um, a lot of quality time uh, with the family. So I've really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And hopefully now things are starting to pick up. And um, I know for myself, um, work is um, starting to, to begin again. And then you, not that you're resentful, I'm grateful that the work is, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think hopefully normality or, or something close to it is coming coming soon. But it's I think most people have said just a time to reset and just enjoy things that you maybe otherwise have taken for granted or, or not noticed that you've missed so much. Yeah, I think things are, are on the move. They're getting busy and there's a lot of uh, positive pushing forward going on. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it is good to be happening. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Lisa Scott, um, you have completed all the questions and you have been a most fantastic guest. Thank you so much um, for all of your interesting answers. I've, I've learned a lot about you today that I didn't know um, and I'm sure other people will find this incredibly interesting. So thank you so much again for your time um, and I hope to see you in the flesh soon. Yeah, great. That was fun. Thanks, Edith. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Hey Legal Quiz. We are releasing more episodes weekly, so please sign up for free to Hey Legal on our website to access our free content, legal updates and more. 
Plus follow us on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram and on all podcasting platforms.